So hello everyone, uh, my name is Barka and I'm part of the collaborative network and exploitation uh, that is organizing uh, those, seri those webinar series. And first I would like to start um, describing myself. Um, I am, um, I am a woman, uh, I wear glasses and I, I have a fair skin. Also, I have um, some house curly hair and I sit behind me, um, uh, it's a blurred background. Uh, so you cannot see the mess that is in my house. And um, then I would like to continue with the land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that Akaronto has been a home to many nations since time immemorial. This include the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. These nations were harmed by the arrival of European, European settlers who's, who have systematically tried to erase those indigenous communities and their teachings. Colonialism and racism are deeply entrenched in the Canadian state and our network, network, the collaborative network to end exploitation, strives to decolonize our work and make a positive contribution to the reconciliation process. You're welcome to put in the chat um, the lens you are joining us from today and introduce yourself. I would like also to continue with the labor acknowledgement because we strongly um, believe that we should acknowledge the labor and sacrifices of poor and racialized workers on those lands. Canada's settler colonial history includes, among others, the exploitation of labor of over 200 years of, ensla of enslaving African and indigenous peoples, charging an immigration hat tax on any person of Chinese origin, agricultural and other migrant workers indentured to their employers with closed work permits. These and other violent practices allowed Canada to accumulate enormous wealth and power. And Canada also continues to profit from this historic and ongoing exploitation of foreign racialized people. As a network, we are also committed to redress the legacy of this violence. Very quickly before we start, because we have a lot of work in front of us uh, today for one hour, um, a few housekeeping uh, items so we um, we will be uh, you will be muted and the chat will be disabled for the presentation part uh, although if you have questions during uh, Amanda's presentation you can uh, send me your question uh, questions via chat and then the chat feature will be uh, turned on once uh, Amanda is uh, done with her presentation also as you see we are recording this session and you will receive um, a recording recording soon after um, the presentation is done. And also card captions are available and can be turned on at any time. We have uh, um, assigned a captioner uh, to lead us in our session today, to help us in our session today. Finally, today we are uh, in the webinar number three of the Do No Harm uh, series. And the title of today's webinar is The Feet of Migrant Workers in Canada. Before I introduce Amanda to you, very quickly some group assumptions. We are already familiar with the topic of human trafficking and what anti-human trafficking work entails. Also, we are here with good intentions because we want to learn more. And finally, we understand that discomfort is part of our role. And without further ado, I would like to present to you Amanda, Amanda Panambi Morales Vidales. Um, she is a graduate PhD student at, a student at the University of Windsor. Uh, and um, she, her, her study is on argumentation. And also she holds a master's degree in social philosophy at La, uh, La Salle University in Windsor. Her bachelor degree in psychology is from the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Amanda's primary research interests are in the fields of argumentation theory and social psychology. Emotions and culture are some of the topics in her research as well. Amanda's current research project is about the logic of emotions in human reasoning. And also um, uh, important part of Amanda's work is uh, her outreach work as an outreach worker 
uh, in the legal assistance of Windsor where she works with migrant workers. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and Amanda, you can um, share your screen now and you can start. Amanda, you're muted. Okay. Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I'm Amanda. I'm a woman. Uh, I have a lot of mess behind me. <laughs> I don't have a blue screen. I, uh, I'm wearing a, a skirt, a blouse, a black with some flowers. And uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation to Varka. Thank you to Shelly and I, I am happy to be here in this and be part of these seminars. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and let's start. Let me see, I'm here and I'm here. So the title of my presentation is The Defeat of Migrant Workers in Canada. I think there's a lot of defeats and of the migrant workers when they come to here in to Canada to work. And well, this is, a, or you already know, I'm a PhD candidate for, um, for the University of Windsor, and I'm a bridge worker for Legal Assistant of Windsor. Uh, this is just a, a quote. Uh, my research is mostly in emotions. So uh, I think, Emotions are a very important part of the human being and they lead us to think and do many things. So I, I, I consider the emotions a very important part, but that's the quote. Um, content, uh, I'm gonna talk about our group, the reasons to come to Canada that the migrant world can have, the population problems, abuse, key role factors, everyday abuse, and some food for thought, like some kind of conclusion. So. Our group, and this is a, I work with Legal Assistant of Windsor and we have a group that in the most important part of this group is work with the migrant community in Livington. But we, we want to generate the empower of the migrant workers. We want to bring them a knowledge, information, referrals when they need it. And we want to build a community with them because I think the community part for them, it is very important that they know that they, they can be part of this community here in Canada, that they know that they can uh, count with someone when they are in troubles. So these are the main objectives of our group. I have here the information. Of course, the, we have our Facebook uh, page. And if you want to reach me and with some more questions about our group, hey, you're more than welcome. So let, let me continue. Uh, the population that I'm talking about in this presentation is workers that are, that, that are in the program of Temporary Foreign Program and SWP. So what are the reasons for these people to come to Canada? No, uh, We have many reasons. And okay, let me go. <laughs> presentations. So the reasons to come, no? Canada probably is one of the best choices and many people, is one of the destination for many people in, in America and in other countries. Uh, many people go to the US, but uh, because there's a spread word to word, word to mouth, Mexicans are seeking a better life. And when they come, they are seeking a better life, mostly because there are factors of, po of poverty in their home countries. This is our, one of the, some of the reasons that the migrant workers are uh, saying about the, why they're coming. I'm just gonna say something very quickly. Uh, Yailin have her son in Mexico and support him economically. Uh, Gustavo, he supports his wife and children in Mexico. Many of those workers come here to help their families. For, 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 I'm not gonna say everybody thinks the same, but 
but uh, for most Mexican Latin American workers that from South America, from Central America, from Mexico, they come here to support their family. And I can talk about my experience with other workers from uh, Jamaica, maybe, and Philippines. They also are supporting their family here. They come to work and support their family. So family is not only the, the sons, and I realize it's not only the sons and not only the, the, the wife or the husband. Family is the grandparents. For us, the, the family is some extended family. Many of the workers are the main economic support of big families, aunts, uncles, cousins, of course, the wife, of course, the husband, and the, the daughters and the sons. So let me continue. Why is not? Okay. It was here. Okay, uh, another event that we can, it's just an example of the reasons that you can find in the home countries of these workers. May, we can find a lot of troubles and problems with criminal justice systems, torture, enforced disappearance. I think this is important because for me, it is important that you know the context. The context is essential in this history and the history of many of these workers. Mm -hmm. In particular, countries like Mexico, Guatemala, uh, has seen an increase in violence and human rights violations. Poverty is one element that crosses all these countries. We can see many different cultural differences, of course, but uh, why we have to start asking us why a migrant worker, a migrant or a people, not a migrant, a people, leaves their family and home country. Maybe there are catastrophic events. And when you talk about catastrophic events, something related to war, you just start thinking, oh, maybe it's because they, they, they first seen war. But it's not only war. I think when someone cannot live and realize that they can live with dignity, with some amount of dignity, that's also violent. So people start th thinking and seeking new options, better options for, for, they, for them and their families. So this is one of, uh, just a slide, but I want to review very quickly some of the issues that the temporary foreign program and agricultural stream has with this worker. The worker is attached to work with only one specific employer. So the, we have closed work permits. This is not the open work permit. This is a closed work permit. In this closed work permit, the worker cannot unionize. The experience years are not accumulable to get an eventual residency. It's very difficult for they, for these workers to get a residency working here in Canada. Migrant workers uh, win 50 per hour, no? regardless of the role. Maybe they, they can be supervisors, but they still making $15 per hour. The worker cannot bring their family, another very complicated issue, because if they want company, if they want their family with them, this social support, they cannot bring them. The family needs to come as a tourist and of course return after six months in the best of the cases. No? And these kind of problems are gonna have, a, have a consequences. We have abusive situations. I'm just gonna review this very quickly because these abuse situations are situations that many advocacy groups um, have documented, no? These issues are not new. Uh, and we have these abuses, housing rights, unsafe living, physical abuse, unsafe working, medical care. Uh, some workers have access to OHIP, no? health services, but they, they, they have these even here problems. No? They, they, they don't seek sometimes um, medical proper care. So let me continue because I'm sees the essence. <laughs> Okay, um, what happened when the abuse starts? Uh, I like this, uh, this I quote in here, uh, 
yeah, an activist from the community, no? And she says that, for example, uh, Mexican workers stay with the same employers as long as there is work for them to do. There's a, uh, something that you call resilience. And many people says, like the Mexican workers or Guatemalan workers, because they work too hard. Because, but also because they endure a lot of uh, abuse, a lot of abuse in this working hard. Let's see why. Oh, I just want to mention very quickly about this notion about power. I think this is a notion very important. And, uh, and Foucault, it, he was a philosoph philosophist, and Foucault talked about this power. I'm just gonna mention that the power is something that happens in every relationship of the people, no? There's relationship of power in every level. So of course there are there are power relationships between employer and is, um, and the the worker, but also there's a relationship between husband and wife, between mother and son, uh, between friends, no? So Foucault talk about the power as at the center of a problem in the abuse of power in the relations, in the relationship between people. So if there's someone who has more power, maybe they can abuse of this power, okay? So it is just very quickly. And we have here the migrant worker, no? The migrant, migrant worker is a vulnerable people, is a vulnerable person. I didn't put the name here, but this is, catastrophic life in their home country, poverty, violence, injustice, corruption, whatever you, you want to mention. The language, when this worker come here to Canada has already this, this, this problem here, has problems with language, has now the employer, the employer has more power. The, this worker don't speak English. Most of these workers don't speak English. So, Anyone who speak English is gonna have power over these workers. They have, um, well, we can see here, new coast customs, no? They are away from the support social service system. They don't know how this bureaucracy or this service and support social justice system is working for them. They don't know. And of course, poverty, they, they are poor people. And of course, the restricted labor rights that they come here, they don't have the full rights when they come here to work. We have some examples and I, I, I think the, the examples are better than, are, are the better, ex, better experience. So for example, Moises or Alejandra. Moises, Moises he, speak English when he came to here to Canada. And because he is speaking English, the supervisor started harassing him. And during the whole time that he was working here, the supervisor harassing him all the time. And the supervisor did not like Mr. Moises talked with Canadian people. Mr. Moises, told me that the supervisor was afraid that he will speak about the different abuses that happen on the farm. Or another example, Alejandra. And one important thing, the names here are not the, the reflected the, the same names that of the cases that I'm working. So as soon as she arrived at work, one of the supervisors started texting her that he liked her, no? she knew that she couldn't denounce the supervisor. This is something that they knew as a woman. So she tried to eh, not to pay too much attention, avoid the, the, sexual, uh, the sexual text messages, avoid to date him. But uh, this has consequences because at the end, the supervisor did not speak well about her work, did not want to hire her again, and this is harassment. And 
he did this because she didn't pay attention to him. Another case, Ramon. Ramon, uh, he was he was uh, sick at, um, in his work, so the supervisor decided to send him because it was in COVID times. Decided to take him to a house and put him in isolation. But uh, that's the only thing that he did. When they put him in the house, they didn't give me, give him any money, any food any blankets, they just leave him there. He was three days with only $15 because this worker as any, any other worker sent all his money to their home countries. So three days with only cookies and water, not even a blanket, not even a COVID test, not medical attention. Abuse, right? Carlos, Carlos filed a labor abuse complaint he, he, he protests about the abuse in his work. He got his work permit. And then he went and looked for lawyers with the, among the community. And these lawyers, at the end of the, this, his year, told him wrongly that he could uh, apply for an open work permit again to renew this open work permit for abuse workers. And then he, government of Canada refused to renew this open work permit for abuse worker because the rule is we cannot renew this work permit and he lost the status because also he can return to Mexico. He's supporting, he's the only support of his family, father, mother, and brother and nephews. He's not married, but he supports his family. So what are the factors that play a key role in the decisions making of this, these uh, migrant workers, because I think that's, that's an important part. When I talk with them, many, sometimes many, they have the help, they have advocacy groups, but sometimes the decision is not there. So what is happening? I, I wonder. I, I found that these factors, emotions, learned helplessness, culture, individual differences, economy, mental health, are important factors in the decision making of the migrant worker. I'm not going to talk about the individual differences because that's individual differences, but I'm acknowledging that, of course, the, the, we have individual differences. Still, we have social factors that are very important to the making decision of the migrant worker. So the first part is the emotions. And I'm gonna talk about only fear. Why only fear? Is not that I don't recognize that we we have many different emotions, and the, the migrant worker has many different emotions. But I think fear, and I I will I would like to bring here this notion because I think fear is a really important part in the migrant worker decision. And when abuse happens, fear, it is central. It is one of the most important and central parts that happen in the migrant worker when, the, when he is in a, an abuse situation. So what are the, the things that the migrant worker has when the fear happens? So fear produces running away from the situations, and fear produces maybe a silence, not talk about this, no? So when the victim of abuse or exploitation fears, is, is, is feeling fear, they tend to not to talk. They don't talk. They don't want to do nothing. They just want to run away and stay in a place where they can feel safe. But this means that they are not gonna make any complaint. We have some examples. Homero, he filed a report of abuse at his place work. No? He's trying to, he's waiting, uh, waiting the results. It turns out that Homero found the boss's son in the community. 
and the boss's son with the, the, his employer, they know that he ran away, that he mm, submit a claim uh, complaining. He asked for an open work permit for vulnerable workers. So he start threatening him and harassing him outside in the community in Leamington in a mall. And Homero didn't want to do nothing. Homero knows that he has rights. Omero knows how, that he can call the police and nothing is going to happen to him because he's, he's with the status. But uh, he only wants to run away. And this is a person who already submitted a complaint, but he's still in fear. Ale, that's another example. Ale uh, worked with the, with seven, during seven years in the company, no? And she suffered a lot of uh, things, a lot of uh, abuse, no? But uh, when she tried to talk about this abuse to human resources, the people of, from human resources told her that she shouldn't say nothing. And they, this is a, a thing that they told the workers. They shouldn't say nothing because when the workers talk, they will know. So they, they are afraid. She, she also, when she speak to me, she speak very, very, in a very soft voice because she's afraid many years, seven years hearing the human resources that she cannot talk about nothing, that she don't have any rights, seven years. Argelia, another example. Argelia was suffering abuse the supervisor at the farm threatened, threatened her, harassed her, harassed her, called her very bad things, no? That she was ugly, that she was a slut. So Ar Argelia just ran away from the farm. That was a help. She ran away and she had many advocacy groups help, help, trying to help her, no? They, they helped her. But uh, when she had to make the decision, to submit a claim, to ask for an upper work permit, to, to arrange her status, Argelia always hesitated. She said, no, I'm just gonna go back to my country. I just want to save some money and go back to my country. This was an awful experience, but I, I need to save money. I think I many, many times have, um, many months passed, and then Algeria became pregnant. So only until that situation, while, while he was, she was here working, then she decided to denounce her case of abuse to try to fix her status and help her with his, his, his pregnancy, her pregnancy, sorry. Another case. Now we have the category of learned helplessness. Where, this is a psychological category that I, I like it because it shows many, many of what is happening to a person who is suffering a constant abuse, a constant not answer of, there's no response. When, let me just learn, <laughs> read this part. Uh, learned helplessness is a state that occurs after a person has experienced a stressful situation repeatedly. They come to believe that they are unable to control or change the situation. So they don't try anymore. We have here the elephant. He's, he can he's get away from that, but he's not gonna try anymore because every time that he tries, he's not gonna make it. So that's, that's what happened when you came here to a new culture and start trying and trying and trying. And when you start trying and you receive a no, 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 and there's no way you, you can do many things, but always is a no, you develop learned helplessness. It is a famous psychological term. It's the, the term when the human is exhausted and fed up and don't want to do anything because there's nothing that this human do to change the situation. I have one example, Argelia, of self-helplessness. Her life in Guatemala 
what happened with this human being who has received no her whole life? Life in Guatemala is extreme poverty, unemployment. She has two kids. She has an abusive husband, maybe sexual abuser. She found out a way to come to work in Canada. Hey, there's a door there. The husband is jealous and constantly harasses and has a lot of fights with Argelia because she's here. Argelia families do not like to help her to raise the kids. The husband take the kids and now the husband is taking care of the children with the, the fear of, of Argelia that may, he might commit abuse, sexual, sexual abuse with them. What is the life of Argelia in Canada? She came to work on a farm where the supervisor abused her. The supervisor insulted her and diminished her. The supervisor made her work, made her work too much time. The supervisor controlled all of Argelia's life. The supervisor tell Argelia what she should do, where, when she, she needs to go, get out of the, the, the farm, when she needs to go and buy groceries. Argelia is not free. Argelia run away from the farm. So what is going to happen with Argelia? Well, this, we have the other key role factor, culture, language, costumes. I think this factor, you know, it is important in two senses. The first sense is that we have what we are. You know? We behave as, as we learn how to behave. So we have all this background, all this uh, lot of uh, bags that tell us or what to do and what to think. This is a matter of how we perceive the reality. And we perceive the reality according to, to our home country. So for example, people who live in an environment of constant, constant violence and insecurity in their country of origin might have a higher threshold of acceptance of violence. Why I'm saying this? Because all of these workers accept abuse because it's part of their lives. If you live in an in a abuse situation, you will not see uh, some situations here in Canada as abuse. Ah, why? No? Maybe it's not abuse, maybe it's not as bad as, as in my home country. So I'm gonna accept this kind of abuse here because it's not that bad. The second aspect is the related with the new culture. They come here and this new culture has different meanings and ways of communication. You know? So this is, it is a new challenge for the migrant because they need to change their perception and new to they need to try to understand the new meanings. They don't belong to the culture, but also they belong because they are here, they are a community. That's why we have our group because they need to know that they belong to this community. They are part of this community. Language is a, a huge and emblematic example, no? Because there's a lot of differences in the language. Let me just breathe. <laughs> this is the same example that I was talking about. This is one of the pictures that probably many of the Latin American, Central American, and Mexico country uh, live every day. This is, that's a body, no? A lot of violence, a lot of crime, a lot of uh, drugs, moths. So what is these images that you're living every day in your community is gonna make, you, you ask yourselves, I, think I would like to do ask yourselves and answer me if you want at the end. What do you think people change seeing this, these kind of images? as part of their everyday lives. And another question, how do you think this will change you, your perception, your actions? Another key factor, of, obviously, is the economy. And in this sense, 
we have one important aspect, which is poverty. The case of the migrant workers, the temporary migrant workers, is very distinctive. Most of them, I, I would like to, most of them come here because they are poor. So they are looking for opportunities. They are looking to build, to grow and to build a family, to have a good life, a, a dignified life. Because, because poverty as poor means that if you are poor, you don't have opportunities. You don't have opportunities to be educated, to grow, to get out of that, of that place. And if you are there in that situation, that situation only comes to, going to leave you to more poverty. So this is one of the like, quotes of the migrant, no? who is going to harm me in my country. I can't come back because no one in my home country earns the salary that I'm earning here. I am paying the cancer treatment of my daughter. I need the money that, that I earn here. Many and all of these workers, if they go back, they're, they never gonna win the money that they make here. They came here to escape of poverty. No? Mental health. In, I'm gonna talk about this key factor because I think it is important in some of, in my experience, the mental health is something that I've been realizing happen in the migrant worker population. Okay, they are resilient. They, they have a, a lot of things in their home country, but they are suffering and the suffering is in their, in their bodies, in their mind. They can develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder is not only for people who, who live very violent events, no? Raping, murder, no? Post-traumatic stress disorder can happen with a very hard life. And it's happening here, having recurring nightmares, avoiding friends and family getting angry easily, having trouble falling asleep. Many of workers have this problem, constantly worrying, being unable to feel pressure, fearing harms from others, having fears of dying. All of these symptoms, the workers, I've been watching them and the workers have these symptoms. Also, uh, there's another syndrome, no? The syndrome of Ulysses. And this is some, only two examples of psychological disorders that I'm pretty sure there must be many of this. But the problem with this psychological disorder is that are happening in the community of migrant workers because of the working conditions. We have the example of Daniel. He has been working for four years in Leamington. He's fast, he's competitive, but uh, he, he suffered a lot of pressure from the supervisor. Somehow he developed uh, mental health problems. And that, this is one of, one of the reasons why workers don't say nothing when they are feeling bad or they feel depression or they feel anxiety. When the supervisor and the company that hired Daniel and Daniel seek help with the, the, the doctor, the doctor sent him pills for depression and sleeping. He went and seek help and he get the help, but when, the company found out about his mental health problems, they returned him and they never rehired him. This is, and this, all the workers know about this. So that's why the workers don't say nothing about mental health problems, not even the physical. Amanda, just yes. to say that you have 10 more minutes. Thank 10 you. more minutes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna try to do this more fast. I'm almost, I almost finished. So I'm one, I want to talk about that, but the abuse as an everyday way of life, because we have, um, we know that there's a lot of abuses, no? But there's a, 
this notion about bail abuse. Abuse can be someone screaming at you, someone hitting at you, beating, beating you. But abuse also is this kind of bail thing that people do and you don't notice. It's not so clear. So what injustice are migrant workers used to put up here in Canada? Mm -hmm. And this injustice has to do with the bail abuse, with the power, everyday power relationships. I have here some examples, no? They tell you that it's better not to talk about the things that happen at the farms because everything is known. The supervisor told the, the people when the inspector arrived, we should not say how we work at the farm. Even we should not say that we didn't do the quarantine. And, and that's an agreement that the supervisors or the employer make with the workers and the workers know that they need to, to follow these, these instructions because they know they will lose their jobs. I have to put up and try to avoid the sexual tone of my supervisor. The supervisor or the employer asked me to sign some documents in English. I don't know what I'm signing, but I have to sign it because if I refuse, if I need a translator or I'm not agree, I know that I'm gonna be returned to my home country. The supervisor always asks me for information about my coworkers. I need to talk about my other coworkers with the supervisor and give him information. When I complain to my resources, they don't believe me. The supervisor speaks to speak my language, does not translate way well, and they know the workers know don't know English, but they know when the supervisor or the human resources, someone is not translating well. I try not to get sick because if I get sick, I'm gonna, the supervisor, the employer is not gonna be happy with me. I have just this last thought, food for thought, two conclusions. The first one has to do with the understanding that the decision that a migrant worker makes to continue in the abusive relationship or not to report have to do with a whole system that is tailor-made for this human being to allow and suffer the systemic abuse. Do you remember the person? He is suffering a lot of power, a lot of abuse in their homeland and here. This system is built from the inequity and violence to the lack of protection of the rights. In this sense, it is important to note that the temporary migrant workers do not arrive with the same rights as any other Canadian foreign worker. Therefore, they suffer and are extremely susceptible to abuse. And the second is because I noticed that this, systemic, this is a systemic method of exploitation. In my point of view, very similar to what in Mexico, we call caciquismo, which is something very similar to slavery. Why? The family of the worker is optional. The migrant worker cannot bring his family with him, cannot bring his family with him. The worker will and private life is dominated in its entirety. Where he lives, with whom, with whom, who, whom he can bring, how long he can work here, with whom he must talk, with whom he must not talk, what language he must not learn, and how he must not be listened to. That's not a free person, right? I always liked this phrase since I was in my university in Mexico. This is from a professor on social psychology, so I would like to read it because this is something that always reminds me what I should do. What matters and what brings us together is not exactly the academy, but to be exact, a young society that we love and that hurt us, and a young future that we also love and that we are not willing to also hurt. Thank you so much. I'm gonna stop sharing, this is after references. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, thank you so much, first of all, um, for showing us that migrant workers who come here are whole human beings uh, with their emotions, 
with their families back home because I think we tend to forget uh, we see only the person when they come here we see on the person who works on the farm or who serves the coffee but we really think around the whole human being of the migrant worker and what makes them them a whole human being and um, there are quite a few webinars talking about policies um, uh, that are affecting um, the migrant workers um, rights but I um, I don't see many webinars talking about the human side of migrant workers, you know, humanizing them. And despite all the fear, the poverty, and all the all those factors that are informing their decisions to stay in the exploitation, migrant workers are organizing, and amazingly, somehow they are finding uh, time and force within them, you know, to organize, um, to be in groups, and to do stuff around migrant justice, which is, um, you know, despite, you know, all the, the obstacles and all the odds that uh, we put in front of them when they come to Canada. Um, so I would, I would like to encourage people to open their mics, uh, to, if you have questions for Amanda, ask your question on the mic or in the chat. Uh, if you have comment, you're welcome to comment in the chat. If you speak Spanish, I hope Amanda will try, you know, to um, help translate your question or your comment. So feel, feel free uh, to do this. And also, I want to say while people are while people are, people are thinking um, and reflecting, and because Amanda gave us so much things to, to reflect on, uh, just to mention uh, talking about migrant justice and migrant uh, and and uh, migrant workers uh, mobility, because you know, and Amanda mentioned that the closed work permits are one of the 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 most. Uh, detrimental policy uh, that is in place in Canada that is affecting migrant workers movement uh, to change employers not as like migrant workers cannot do this as any other Canadian worker if you are abused you can change easily free, freely employers migrant workers cannot do this and I want to happily announce that tomorrow uh, the migrant workers uh, committee of the Canadian Council for Refugees is launching a national coalition on open work permit um, I will send the link to people to register if they want to participate tomorrow at the lunch event, because with this open work permit coalition, we would like to pressure the government and, and tell them that finally it's time to abolish the, the closed work permits and to allow migrant workers to freely change employers, uh, which will diminish in many ways the, um, the exploitation that they, they, they face. Okay, I, I see Shelly has a question. Shelly, go ahead. And two, I don't know, Vark, if it's just me, but um, it says the chat is disabled. So if somebody yes, did want course, to put it in there. Because I forgot, thank you so much. You're welcome. Yes. Amanda, I wonder if you might speak about your feeling like around the migrant worker group and sort of the evolution that you might have seen individually and as a community um, through the different practices that you and um, Claudia are are using in in supporting and, and sort of establishing that infrastructure um, with regards to the migrant worker group. So I guess I'm asking if you see some best practices or or you know some of the challenges in establishing the group and um, if, if you could talk a little bit about what you're seeing individually amongst the members and, and sort of collectively uh, amongst the members of the migrant worker group. Yeah, uh, I like the, the, the project of our, uh, the migrant worker, the migrant monarchs, we call ourselves like that, because uh, I we have with them a lot of activities. We have uh, with them, kitchen activities, sharing recipes. We, we have also talks, immigration talks, or we have mental health talks. Whatever uh, the workers ask us because they need it, or whatever we think it is important. Like for example, English classes, we have English classes. But uh, uh, with the, the pass of the different the, the months, I observe uh, the workers as a, with more more confident, you know, they are more confident. They talk more. 
they participate more, they want to be involved in the community and they help another people, which is very important. They show solidarity with other workers. So I, I ha I'm happy to say that I, I've, I've seen a lot of uh, migrant women growing and men too, growing and doing outreach work, becoming as a, an activist person that shares the, the, the knowledge that they produce in the group, that they, even they, they, they give us workshop. Right now we have, a, we recently have a, one of the workers giving a mental health talk and another worker, she's gonna give us a first aid talk no, because she's a nurse. So they are sharing, they are sharing their knowledge and they are more um, powerful, you know? They are empowered. As a community, I think as a group, they are developing more connections. They know that they have people who may support them. And the people is trying to do the best of, as they can because they know that sometimes they are the only support to maybe give a, a person a, a room because they are out of uh, their home. And one of our workers uh, uh, is receiving a, another woman because she lost her job and he lost her home. So these kind of uh, things are very important in solidarity. We call it solidarity. And we sometimes we lose these uh, solidarity, solidarian relationships that I think is very, very important to have. But also they are building community and it's little by little, but I think they are seeing themselves as a community and as a community in Canada, not a community that is, is from other countries, another culture. They're, they are becoming and they are appropriating this territory as part of the community. You know? That's what I see. <laughs> Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> she said, uh, thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions? And you know, we uh, we talked to Amanda because the issues that are faced uh, faced by migrant workers in Canada are so many. And um, and one of the one of the less spoken um, subjects when it comes to migrant workers is the women migrant workers and um, a specific issues that are affecting women migrant workers because of the intersection of gender and um, and immigration status, and Amanda agreed to you know to do a continuation of this webinar and talking specifically about those about those issues. And I cannot wait. We uh, we continue the talk. Well, if there is no uh, if there are no questions, um, I would like to thank Amanda and everybody uh, for being here. Um, Please don't forget uh, our next webinar is uh, next week, Thursday, and it's going to uh, be on uh, human trafficking, sex trafficking, and um, and black girls, specific, uh, specific issues um, that are affecting um, uh, black girls in trafficking. So uh, thank you so much. Have a lovely afternoon and see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Barca. <laughs> we'll see you.